Hi everyone, welcome back to Ethics Analytics and the Duty of Care. Still working our way through Module 7, getting to the home stretch here. Uh, module 7 is the decisions we make as we apply analytics and AI in learning technology. This video is about testing and application. We'll look a bit at the huge role that testing and application plays in the uh, development and deployment of AI and analytics solutions in learning. It's not something that's often mentioned by uh, people talking about the ethics of AI, but I think it's probably one of the most significant aspects of AI and uh, certainly um, one where a number of ethical decisions come to the fore. So to begin with this, let's look first at just testing and application generally. Uh, here's a, a sort of a broad look at some of the things that are considered, not just in uh, AI and machine learning based systems, but in applications generally. Everything from configuration to data collection, feature extraction and verification, analysis tools, infrastructure monitoring, and the rest. Um, there are some differences that are fairly significant between AI and analytics applications and your routine software applications. But over the years, uh, for regular software applications and then for AI applications, a significant testing infrastructure and methodology has developed and it's worth taking a look at that. To begin with, in testing, we want to think about the, object uh, the objections, the objectives of our testing protocol. Uh, this is a fairly typical process here. Uh, it's, it's reflected in different formats. Uh, the idea, of course, is to prevent defects, to evaluate the work product, maybe verify requirements, build confidence in the application, reduce, reduce the risk of using the application, and of course, to find failure and defects. There's a whole bunch of different models that talk about different areas, uh, different objectives of testing and evaluation of software. In general, there's an overall approach. And it's interesting to note that the overall approach to testing uh, software applications is very similar to the overall approach for the actual use of these applications. First, you need to define your goals, perhaps identify key performance indicators, collect the data. In this case, now it'll be the testing and evaluation data. Analyze that data perform some test alternatives, which we'll talk about, and then implement whatever changes are, are required by the, the results of the test. Testing can be depicted in what's called a V model for testing. I've uh, produced here the, the double V model. There's a single B, V model, which is sim simpler. And I even found a, a triple V model, which I thought was probably a little bit too much for our tastes. Um, basically what the V model does is it begins with what's known as a waterfall development framework and then works from that. Now the waterfall framework, it, you sort of think about software development as a waterfall. It flows from user requirements to system requirements, then to the architectural models, component design, and then unit design. And so there are tests that follow all of those. But then for the overall software testing, you go up the other side to form your V. So when you're, you've done your unit design, then you do unit testing. Once you've got your components developed, you do component testing, and in particular, component integration testing. Similarly, with the uh, architecture, you're now looking at subsystem testing, then system testing, and then finally, we get back to the users, and we're looking at acceptance or operational testing. 
This same process is going to be similar to what's adopted in an AI or analytics framework. And perhaps it won't, won't be structured as a pure waterfall because in a lot of applications today, a much more dynamic or agile software development methodology is used. But nonetheless, all of these testing steps are going to be required at some point or another in the process. And becoming more iterative in software design is reflected in becoming more iterative in software testing. One of the things that makes artificial intelligence and analytics distinct is the necessity of testing data. Now there's, again, a, a huge industry uh, devoted to defining the data collection, storage, and management process. And I've kind of illustrated the major steps of that in the diagram here. Well, I've kind of illustrated, I borrowed the diagram uh, from the, uh, the web page here. Um, but basically, you start with source data, you, be, you drop all of that into a data warehouse, which may contain a data lake, which is a whole pile of undifferentiated data, which is then divided into data pools. Then it's staged and presented in what's called a data mart, or sometimes cubes, and output in the form of reports and statistics. Now the analytics and AI process takes advantage of this data flow and can actually pull data from any point of this. But the point here is that all of the quality insurance, quality assurance or uh, data validity metrics that apply for data management generally uh, also apply to data management for artificial intelligence. In addition, AI and analytics look at what may be called the six V's um, for data. Data volumes, where you're testing for semantics and processing scalability. Data variety, here we're looking at different types of data, different types of objects, how those objects interrelate. Data federation, which is to say data that's located in multiple places or a variety of locations and perhaps in a variety of formats. Data velocity. Uh, this is real-time data, how real-time data is coming in, how data can be tested, as they say, on the fly, how real-time data can be integrated into the data process, and then on-demand storage, in other words, a mechanism for bringing in and storing data as it arrives. And so you increase your storage capacity as you increase your data. There's also the validity of data. Here we apply rules for, you know, simple example, um, making sure that your calendar dates have a month, day, and uh, year. Uh, making sure that your telephone numbers have the correct number of digits. Making sure your addresses have a street name, maybe if that applies, or a country if that applies. Things like that. Uh, and then, of course, removing invalid data. Variability in data. Uh, not all data comes in the same formats. I just mentioned dates. We have the European system of dates versus the American system of dates, where the month and the day are transposed. Uh, there are also wide variations in data regarding addresses, phone numbers. A lot of systems standardize on a North American model, but that in a global world would obviously be a mistake. Things like that. And then finally, the veracity of data. Is the data accurate? Is it a true reflection of what it purports to describe? Is the data, for example, on sales an accurate reflection of the sales? Is the data on grades or marks the actual grades or marks that were submitted by the instructor? So all of these need to be tested. Um, once we're into the actual development of a learning analytics application, what we're in the process of is making requests of that system. Now, remember from previous 
episodes that the uh, AI model is first developed or trained with data and then in practice we typically feed it some new data and then get the results back. So we need to test for all of these stages or at least you know that's best practice. So for request testing it's important to ensure that the correct data is being collected. This is by the application that is going to send a request to the AI system. Uh, it needs to make sure that the format uh, of the request is correct. Typically, uh, a JSON data object would be used to send the request to the AI system. This needs to be validated with a JSON parser. Um, and again, needs to be checked to make sure that all the fields or all the data variables or field elements have been properly filled out. And then to ensure that the request is properly sent. So it actually gets to where you want it to go. And then you get the response back. The process also has to be validated in general. Um, again, you have dynamic data. Uh, what they call in the data world is CRUD. Um, create, read, update, and delete. Now, delete is CRUD's uh, least favorite application. You don't want to delete data ever if you can avoid it. Although it's, you know, one of these design decisions. But really, uh, for trackability, uh, for reliability, it's normal to mark a piece of data as deleted but to not actually delete it. And that, of course, has implications for things like general pr uh, data protection regulations or the Br European GDPR. They're also checking for things like duplicate requests. Uh, I've had that happen to me in my program where I write a little subroutine and then for some reason I'm calling it twice. I don't know why I'm calling it twice. I get the exact same answer back both times, obviously. Um, sometimes when you do that, though, um, you get uh, concatenated results rather than a replacement result, which, of course, breaks the system. Uh, missing requests. Uh, if your AI system isn't responding to every request that is sent to it, that's obviously a problem. And then, obviously, cross-browser functionality and cross uh, platform functionality. Does it work in different browsers? Does it work on mobile devices, etc.? All of these may sound really picky, but all of these play a role in how an analytics and AI system performs when it is actually used and therefore how it continues to collect and analyze data. An application that rolls out and is broken for whatever reason is going to produce inaccurate predictions or projections or categorizations and then these will be carried over into the eventual use of that application and will result in consequences that may be harmful. The application itself um, requires common everyday software application testing processes. Again, this is very well covered in the field, uh, so there's not a need to go into this in depth. Um, but uh, again, from the uh, V model that we saw before, unit testing, integration, system, and acceptance testing. And then also there's non-functional testing. For example, performance, how fast is it? security, which should be obvious, usability, and then compatibility, again, with other software, uh, with various platforms, etc. There's nothing more annoying, than, and trust me, I know, than an AI application that won't run because you've got some other software that's incompatible installed on your system. Um, I mentioned usability testing, and this is going to apply um, not just to the actual system that creates or, or that calls the application, but, but also with things like dashboards, 
and other systems that present the data or present the results of the analytical process. Um, in usability, it's very common to use what's called A-B testing. And that's where you present two different versions, uh, a control version of your user interface, which is generally what you're using now, and then a new version, a variation, and you compare the results. And you compare them over a period of time because you know, there's a certain uh, comfort with the existing control version and that will be reflected in the testing but then over time you might see the new version getting a better response rate whatever that means and again you, you need to define that uh, a better response rate and uh, that would suggest uh, a reason to change your interface multivariate testing is similar to a b testing except of course uh, you can test multiple variables. What's interesting in all of this uh, discussion of testing is how much of it depends on what you value as you enter into the testing process. Uh, we began, remember, by uh, what the objectives, the testing objectives were, and we also go all the way back to what the objectives of the analytic system is itself. And then that's what tells us what we're going to be testing for. There are some common parameters, like you know how well it functions, are there coding mistakes, is it dropping data when it sends back and forth, which are, you know, independent of any particular ethical perspective you may have. Although, you know, maybe some people like the random software results ethical perspective, but most people don't. But others really do come into play. For example, um, what your attitude is toward the user might have a lot to say about how you're going to evaluate user acceptance testing. Uh, who you think the stakeholders are. Uh, is, is a significant factor. You might not care, for example, how students react to the uh, application because they're not the ones paying for it. They will just have to adapt. You may care a lot, however, about how the instructors are able to use the application in order to learn about their students. These kinds of decisions come into play at all steps of the process. The end report, I mentioned that before, um, the usability aspects, etc. Uh, one of the best remarks that I read um, in this uh, automated testing guide is that if you're testing at the end report stage, you've probably started your testing too late. By the time you get to your end report, most of your testing really needs to have already been done and your report is the presentation only of fully validated and fully tested analytics applications. Now, of course, there's a, you know, the, the usability of the report itself, and there are going to be eth uh, aesthetics, um, which are of a, a concern. And also, too, uh, there are ways of presenting data and statistics that are more or less misleading. Ethics can apply here, but it's not so much a matter of testing as much as it is a matter of ethical decisions about how you're going to present your analytics. Are you going to do that in an honest, forthright way? Or, as is so often the case, are you going to do it in a way that serves your best interests? There's a um, I don't have a slide for it, unfortunately, but uh, uh, but I think I can find it. Can I find it quickly right in the middle of the presentation? I'll bet you I can. So let's do that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go to my pocket application. Um, so we'll just pop into that quickly. And... There we go, it's right on top. How about that? So, this is something called Simpson's Paradox. 
and it's as 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 uh, the slide here says it's a problem in statistics where trends appear in different groups of data but disappear or even reverse when these groups are combined so here we have uh, data grouped into pink and blue, presumably women and men, although, you know, it could be any pink and blue. And you see this nice upward trend in each of them. But if I were to combine all of these into one piece of data and ignore the fact that some are pink and some are blue, I'd get a very clear downward line, almost perpendicular to the upward line that was actually described by the data. So, we see this in a document called A Nation at Risk, the Imperative for Educational Reform. And here are the scatter plots that were used to show that the education system is declining. But look what happens, right? Here we have two groups and you can see it's actually not declining at all. It's actually improving quite a bit. But if you eliminate the distinction between the groups, and yet have the exact same data, you can make it look like it's declining. Uh, this is a concern because, as it says here, um, you know, it was shown that uh, uh, you know, the, the data were declining. Uh, it resulted in a whole new approach to education. Um, and... <laughs> Here we have the cartoon discussion of what happened. Quote, yeah, yeah, I heard it all before. I sleep through class. I don't study and never do my homework. Wait till the teacher merit pay bill passes. Then we'll see whose F that is, end quote. Um, and that's what happened. The report led to the creation of No Child Left Behind which tied education funding and teacher evaluation, etc., to standardized test scores, etc., all based on a very particular representation of the data. So that's the sort of thing that can happen um, when you're doing data analysis and when you're not careful to present the results of your data in a forthright and ethical manner. Um, what's really significant here is that this can still happen, but now it's happening when it's being done by an AI algorithm. And so if you're only noticing something like that, by the time it gets to the end report and the end report says something like, oh, education is declining, and you know from your own observation that you shouldn't be reaching that conclusion, uh, it's probably too late to fix what the problem was. The problem isn't in the report. The problem was way back when you segmented the data into one group instead of two groups. And uh, well, we, we did some, some uh, slides on how the data might be segmented, uh, how the data might be clustered, and how many clusters you decide to have with your data. Well, it has a, a direct bearing on what your end report is going to say. Um, just to note, uh, a lot of testing is currently done by hand or manually, but at large volumes, which is what's going to be needed if analytics are going to be deployed to any great degree in the education system, what will be necessary is automated testing. And the whole process starts again, right? Because you need to design your automated testing application. You need to be sure that you know what your automated testing application is testing for, how you're collecting your data from your application, are you segmenting it properly, uh, etc. cetera. Um, there's a whole, um, reams and reams of material on automated AI testing and it's interesting um, 
you know, I haven't seen discussion on the part of AI ethics about the ethics of automated AI testing. Presumably all of the same concerns apply. Um, and more, you know, what is it that these automated testing systems are going to test for? How is that decided? Uh, where is the uh, transparency in those sorts of decisions? Usually, they're designed by software engineers for software engineers. And it almost wouldn't make sense to have you know, public input into automated testing because what's the public going to be able to say about it? Nonetheless, automated testing is what's determining whether the actual software applications are passing the tests and are considered usable by the wider community. So there needs to be some consideration of the ethics of automated testing as well. Uh, this is this and, and related issues is where standards for validation and transparency come in. Um, I've thrown in a diagram from IAB. Uh, of course, there are many standards organizations, IEEE, ISO, Canada Standards Council, many more. Um, these standards define um, how rigorous the uh, the testing needs to be. If if the analytics is for uh, a process where there is considerable risk to the individual, for example, medical procedures, then the rigor will be higher. But uh, if it's for textbook recommendation, it's hard to imagine that the standards would be as rigorous. Uh, generally, there's the requirement, which is tested for by the standards body, that data is not shared with identifiable data. Uh, as well, um, there's a need to be clear about the use of variables such as age, gender, primary payer, it's a US system, right? Um, uh, and again, it's a health system, so inpatient utilization, blood pressure, etc. Uh, that would be interesting if they did blood pressure tests for educational purposes. Um, but that's the sort of thing that you really want to be transparent about, right? If you are testing students' blood pressure before and after exams, say, and then using that in an analytics process, that is something that should be transparent. People should know that the data is being used and indeed even how it is being used. And then, of course, in education as well as healthcare, because of the potential of conflict of interest, uh, I love the way they say this in the Health Affairs document. Scientific peer review and independent validation are desirable. Um, I include under testing an application something like an outcomes assessment. Um, this could also be categorized under the heading of evaluation, which I'll talk about later on. There's a distinction to be made between the testing of the software to make sure that it actually works the way it's supposed to work, and then the evaluation of the software, which describes whether the software is doing the sort of thing that you hoped it would do. Um, and that latter question will be the subject of the next video. And I'm focused more right now on whether the software does what it is designed to do. Um, but it's nonetheless relevant to talk about outcomes because part of what it's designed to do, uh, especially in education, is to improve things like, say, learning outcomes. Um, and the actual impact that it has on learning outcomes is a significant part of the testing of any AI or analytics solution in education. The reason why I put that here is, as we'll see, oftentimes the testing and the development of the software go hand in hand. And we'll talk a bit about how that works, but what I wanna say here is that um, there are various kinds of outcomes 
and it's important that uh, developers and, and implementers look at and take into account all of these different kinds of outcomes. Um, the uh, Disruptive Educator uh, paper where I got this particular diagram, or sorry, the, the, the Health Affairs document that I've been quoting throughout here, talks about three types of outcomes and I've kind of translated them so that they're educational outcomes but um, you get uh, first of all hard what they call hard endpoints um, they talk about readmissions and relapses etc in education you might talk about readmissions or having to take the grade again failures exam failures uh, grades stuff like that then there are secondary outcomes such as care, trust, anxiety, and activation. And then third, provider-centered outcomes. Uh, these are outcomes, in, in our case, related to teachers, instructors, professors, etc. So what their workflow ends up looking like, um, how satisfied they are with the product and with their work in general. So these outcomes <clears throat> are assessed using various assessment methods uh, presumably by the learning analytics tool and then that feeds into teaching and learning activities um, when doing outcomes assessment it is arguable and i would argue that multiple outcomes should be considered we see so many assessments of learning technology based on something simple like course grades or in the in the world of MOOCs completions very simple very one-dimensional hard outcome uh, to use the taxonomy from the previous slide but it's important I think to collect multiple outcomes and the health affairs document concurs because each outcome might tell a different story each outcome presents a different picture of how the analytics or AI system is working in this particular educational environment. Maybe scores are up, but maybe people hate it, for example. Um, it's interesting, indeed, that uh, when we look at multiple outcomes, we can look at uh, multiple applications in multiple contexts. And the key question that comes up here is whether the model, the AI model, we've talked about that, that is developed can be used in multiple contexts or whether you need to rebuild the model each time you apply it in a new context. Uh, obviously, the second option is a lot more expensive and time consuming. It doesn't even seem like AI makes a whole lot of sense in that kind of context. And that pressures, I think, a lot of people to say, well, I'll just take this model that was developed here and I'll use it over here. Um, whether it can be reconfigured to local contexts uh, impacts the reliability of the model uh, and the utility of the model and raises questions as to whether it should even be used in these alternative contexts. And then again, how you're making that decision. On what basis you're deciding that the model is, as they say, transferable. Um, in determining whether a model is transferable, again, it's important not just to be measuring the single outcome, but looking at multiple outcomes and ensuring that different student voices and instructor voices are heard. To the extent that you're taking in these considerations, you are making, I would argue, ethical decisions. Um, there's, you know, the look at the different levels of assessment and types of assessment that can be made of students and technology uh, in an educational environment. Now, this is looking at student assessment, this diagram in particular, but we can apply that diagram as well to uh, learning analytics applications. 
And we could measure the knowledge that's developed, the skills, the attitudes and values, the behaviors, and indeed anything on Bloom's taxonomy, for that matter, from various perspectives, whether of the individual or, or of the group, and whether from a, a teaching perspective or whether uh, for an accountability perspective. In other words, to use the terminology of the field, formative assessment, where we're trying to inform and help the individuals or groups, or summative assessment, where we're trying to evaluate uh, the individual or the group. And that same sort of process takes place with educational software as well. Uh, the other thing about uh, testing the software are the individual settings. Where this software is tested is very common to test software applications in a lab using artificial or generated data. And there are, there are tools out there that will create reams and reams of test data that you can use. And those are useful for scalability tests, performance tests, etc. But when you're testing the model itself, you need to make a decision about how real the data is that you'll be testing it against, whether it's simple forms or shapes or characteristic shapes or actual real objects in this case, right? This would be for a machine vision type of thing or something like that. Similarly, you're going to be taking, you're going to be making decisions about the fidelity or the accuracy of the testing environment for any analytics or AI application. It is test tempting, isn't it, to want to test it all the time on real people in a real educational environment. Um, but questions come up, right? What about consent? Certainly in the GDPR world, uh, in Europe, it's arguable that consent is going to be required. But the health affairs document, which talks about testing of AI solutions in a health context, suggests that and I quote, it is unclear whether explicit consent to the use of personal data in predictive analytics is legally or ethically required. And that seems like an odd conclusion to draw, but look at the reasoning. Uh, first of all, patients might not even be aware that their physicians are using computerized decision aids. Similarly, students might not be aware that their teachers are using computerized decision aids. Secondly, if they could opt out of those systems, that might give them priority over other people. Um, you can imagine how a student opting out of a computerized decision aid that the teacher is using would then, as a result, get better and more personal scrutiny by the teacher. And that could give them an advantage, could also give them a disadvantage. Really hard to judge. And then third, um, the institution under, and this is a quote again, the institutions under consideration should be required to explain whatever predictive analytics development and evaluation they are undergoing and the, and the likely benefits and risks. Now, that's kind of a generic thing. And it's kind of like saying, at least as I'm interpreting this, uh, tell patients or students in this case that you're using predictive analytics, they're under development, and there is testing taking place, um, and here are the risks, if any. Um, and then you don't need to worry about getting their permission, per se, because of these other factors. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. And you might say, well, that doesn't make sense. But here's how. Um, I use, in my work, and including when I'm teaching, an application called Microsoft Word. Now, this application is constantly being tested 
by Microsoft. And that includes, you know, every once in a while it says, you know, do you consent to send back test data back to Microsoft? And I say, yeah, sure. Because I want Microsoft to have a better product. Now, it would seem odd to then, for me to then have to turn around and tell my students that uh, Microsoft Word is being tested by the developers of Microsoft Word. And the reaction should be something like, well, yeah, of course they are. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Um, that could also be the case using Excel. Excel is a spreadsheet program. I might be recording their grades on it. Uh, I could be using it to do statistical calculations about trends in my class. And Excel is constantly being tested by Microsoft. And it's being tested using real world data. But again, it doesn't seem that it follows that there's an obligation for me to inform my students that Microsoft is testing Excel. Of course they're testing Excel. They're always testing Excel. Again, we would be surprised if they weren't. So the argument here, I think, and, and I'm not sure it's a bad one, is that testing of AI and analytics applications is a necessary and continuous process that is going to happen and we can say in general the software that we're using is undergoing testing and evaluation and that includes when we're using it in this class um, but it doesn't make sense to have an opt-out consider uh, an opt-out clause for that process how do you opt out of software testing when the application itself is being tested? Anyhow, but food for thought. On the other hand, <laughs> and there is another hand here, uh, a lot of software is, well, not just software, a lot of research in general takes place in conditions where the users of the research are directly implement, implicated in the development of the research. And there's two phases of this development. First is something called knowledge translation, uh, a term that was coined by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, or CIHR, back in 2000. It can be defined as, and I quote, the exchange, synthesis, and ethically sound application of knowledge within a complex system of interactions among researchers and users and the idea here is that you're taking your research you want to be able to realize some benefit from the research in this case it's AI and analytics research so you translate that into practice in our case into classroom or online learning practice and then evaluate for the benefits uh, or presumably realize the benefits. Now that felt a bit one way, uh, where all the research was done, being done by the researchers and all the implementation was being done by the implementers. Implementers, that's a great word actually, implementers. Uh, the implementers, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, but people envisioned and wanted to work toward, I think reasonably, a more interactive process. And that's where we get knowledge mobilization from. So this is quoted, this is defined in a SHIRK document, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada as, and I quote, activities related to, or relating to the production and use of research results, including knowledge synthesis dissemination, transfer, exchange, and co-creation or co-production by researchers and knowledge users. Which is a mouthful, so I added a quote from a University of Winnipeg document that makes it a bit clearer. A term to use to define the connection between academic research or creative works and organizations, people, and government. And the idea of knowledge mobilization is that the research and implementation of the research is designed and conducted 
by people working in the application area and people working on the research side in conjunction with each other. They're working together rather than one group doing the research and the other group doing the implementation. So what this does is it makes the development and deployment of artificial intelligence and analytics applications something that is done not only by AI developers and researchers, but the people about whom the AI or analytics is intended to operate. This is especially the case if the knowledge mobilization actually includes students uh, on which these applications would be used, on which the evaluations would occur. Uh, it's kind of hard to get that exactly right because students are a moving target. Uh, the analytics that you plan with grade 10 students, by the time you apply them, those grade 10 students are in grade 12 and you're applying them on a brand new group of grade 10 students. Maybe you can design a system that grows as the students grow. That, that would take a more coordinated project, I think. But, you know, and that might be worth doing. Again, uh, it's hard to weigh the different options and the best decision on that probably varies from context to context and and we arguably would know the right approach when we saw it although as usual we probably wouldn't agree on that so with respect to application and especially with things like knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization in mind we look at some of the issues and decisions made in the application of AI and analytics in the actual classroom or online learning environment. And the first kind of question that comes up is the question of access. And there are a couple of ways to, to draw this out and draw out some of the implications. First of all, um, there's the risk that not everybody will benefit equally from the models. Um, this is especially the case if it costs money to use them. And it's the sort of thing, you know, that uh, advanced analytics would thus be applied at Ashbury Collegiate, where the rich kids go to school in Ottawa, as opposed to Osgoode Township High School, which is out in the country and is usually the last to get these sorts of benefits. Um, it's argued in the health affairs document that, quote, as a matter of fairness, those who contribute most to developing a model, including the patients who contribute their data, should proportionately enjoy its benefits. That's a very particular definition of fairness, right? Uh, it's basically a definition of fairness along the lines of whoever pays gets the benefits. Uh, it's definitely not fairness on uh, as defined along the lines of from each according to their means to each according to their needs. So different way of looking at things. Also Barry Dubrun brings up the point asking what about the impact of fees, costs and other factors with respect to the model itself. And stop and think about that for a second. If the only people who can access your analytics model are rich people, then only rich people are feeding in to the development of your analytical model, which means that your analytical model is going to be designed to meet the needs of rich people. And so even if poor people can access this model, which maybe they can't, the model won't have been designed to meet their needs. So access barriers can actually have an influence on the design of the AI or analytics application to begin with. We don't necessarily see that so much on a school versus school or institution versus institution basis. 
But with the bulk of work in the development of analytics and artificial intelligence being done in North America, Europe, and China, uh, people who are living and working in other areas of the world, and I'm thinking especially of the rest of Asia, Africa, and South America, they're looking at the development in AI and analytics and, and asking themselves, or they should be asking themselves, are these models being developed in such a way that they can be adapted to our circumstances as well? Or are we going to have to do the whole work of developing AI ourselves as well? And that, that's a global problem because that puts them further behind in uh, international development uh, and does not narrow if you will, the gap between rich and poor nations. Um, also, the application of analytics has a lot to do with access and power. And again, this can have an impact on how the development of the annex, uh, analytics plays out. Uh, Analytics gives you a really excellent view of the data um, such that it's almost like you can do almost anything with it. And as uh, Stacy Higginbotham said in uh, This Week in Google uh, last year, I quote, when you have near omniscience, how you choose to apply that becomes a matter of importance. And to which I would say, no kidding. Um, look how analytics has been applied in the field of crime prevention, for example, where we see not just the resources of the police, but also the, the media um, and politicians and everyone else applied to solve the robbery of a well-off white woman, but not of a poor black woman. Um, and if you think that's not really a thing outside the United States, um, we could point to cases in Canada of the, if, if I may say, disgraceful treatment of murdered and missing indigenous women in this country, um, which was for many years uh, just simply felt to be unimportant by police investigators. And so access and power and equity and justice are all going to play into the application of AI, but because the application of AI is so integrated with the development and testing of AI, they feed right back into um, how we evaluate and how we improve our AI and analytic systems. And you know, if we end up tweaking them more and more and more to meet the needs only of those who have access and power, then it's arguable that there will be ethical uses, or sorry, unethical uses of this technology in the future. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next presentation. Um, with respect to application, there's also the human element. We, we have to keep in mind that it's humans who are using all of this technology. It's humans who are applying artificial intelligence and analytics, and it's humans that are being described by it. James Clay writes, we must not forget the human element of data and analytics. It's not enough to deliver accurate analysis predictions and visualizations. Staff and students in universities and colleges need to be data literate to enable them to understand and act on that data. Appropriate and effective interventions will only be possible if staff and students are able to understand what is being presented to them and know what and how they could act as, as a result." End quote. Now, we've seen this a lot in software deployment and subsequent evaluation where 
a perfectly good application or a perfectly good piece of technology is dumped on a school with no instructions and no support. And there have been stories, right, of the uh, laptops sitting in cupboards or, you know, the, the uh, training application that never gets used. And the same sort of thing could and probably will happen with learning analytics. And so when we're testing and evaluating learning analytics, it's important to take into account how these are being used in the sense of, first of all, are they being used? Secondly, are the people using them, uh, were they properly informed or trained or whatever? Uh, were they properly supported in the use of these applications? Now in an ideal world, perfectly well developed, developed software wouldn't really require support. Uh, I can't remember the last time I had elevator training, for example. I go into the elevator, I press the button, it takes me there. Perfect, right? Um, but there was a time when it was hard. <laughs> and there was a time when we had elevator operators. I actually remember seeing elevator operators. You never see them anymore, but I'm old. Um, Similarly, you know, ideally you wouldn't need any support or help with an AI application, but this is all new for everyone. And so if we're going to evaluate it, we need to evaluate it in conditions which are conducive to the successful use of the application. And again, what counts as support, how much support you need, what kinds of support you need, all of the answers to all of these questions are going to have ethical implications because they're going to speak to how we expect the analytics to be used. And how we expect it to be used is a major component of whether or not its use is ethical. If the people who are helping instructors are not helping them toward ethical use of analytics, but instead toward eth unethical use, whatever that is, then our assessment of whether the technology is ethical or unethical will be adjusted or altered or changed. Um, implementation errors for AI and analytics might be caused by zeal, that's a, a nice word. Uh, again, that's the health affairs document that I've been re referring to used to that particular term. Or by pressure to cut costs. May result from poorly constructed workflows. Um, it's kind of a variation on garbage in, garbage out, except not quite. It's like garbage is still garbage no matter what. No, that's a bad phrasing. But you get the idea, right? Uh, if you haven't adapted your workflows to take advantage of the data and the analytics, then it doesn't matter what you do with the data and the analytics, you've still got an issue. And now you can't evaluate the, you know, the data and the analytics without taking into consideration whether your workflows were designed to take advantage of it. There may be incons insufficient consideration of client preferences. There may be inadequate checks and balances on machine decision making. And there may be cases where AIs designed for one purpose are actually, and perhaps surreptitiously, used for another purpose. Um, and it's all still very, as they say, brittle. And this is especially the case for full-fledged, what they call end-to-end -end techniques, which eliminates all the levels of human processing. So this would be, for the most part, unsupervised learning. Uh, for example, a speech-to-text system that learns to map directly from sound waveforms through to letter strings, right? With no intervention in between, uh, these are, as Mark Lieberman says, especially brittle. So right now, and, and for the foreseeable future, these applications, 
no matter how they're designed, uh, are, are going to be limited to specific uh, domains. And that means that errors in how they're implemented is going to have a significant impact on how we test them and how they fare with respect to these tests. Finally, um, there's, and this goes back to what James Clay said about humans, there's always the implication of choice in the application of any system. And when we're testing a system, this continues to apply. Um, now the health affairs document says, and it says so quite rightly, to help consumers of the model, both patients and providers, the model must present them with choices. Well, there are different kinds of choices. Uh, for example, what data to consider, uh, what options uh, would be considered un unacceptable, uh, perhaps uh, demographic data that you want to input or not input, etc. On the other hand, um, not all choices are free choices. And the term choice architecture refers specifically to a concept developed by Cass Sunstein and Richard Taller um, which says basically that decision-making is impacted by how the options are shown. Now, again, I, we can do a whole presentation on that, and I won't. Um, but it's important to take into account how we've presented the options for how people make choices, which determine how well the artificial intelligence or analytics application worked for them, the results of which will show up in the testing that we do, especially testing at the higher end uh, with respect to uh, systems testing and user satisfaction. So that's what we have to say for now on um, uh, testing and application of AI and analytics and again it's a broad area you've seen how many sorts of decisions are taken a lot of what counts as good testing and good implementation has already been studied and reported on in other domains of software, software development, and research application and development generally. AI does, does bring in its own considerations and its own wrinkles, especially with respect to data and especially with respect to complexity, but also related to the brittleness of the technology and related to the context sensitivity of the technology. It's not the sort of thing that you can just move from place to place the way you can move a word processor or a calculator or a video game. Um, nonetheless, even within those constraints, the way you approach testing, the things that you decide are worth testing, the outcomes that you want to measure with the tech with your testing process uh, that you expect to achieve as you know software functioning as it should all of these have ethical implications how you see your ai and how you test for it is an ethical perspective and it's not one where it's clearly the case that any of the ethical theories or any of the ethical codes that we've talked about really applies directly. And in fact, as I commented, most of the discussion that I've read on the ethics of artificial intelligence and analytics is pretty much silent on the testing process. It, it will talk about applying AI models out of scope or out of domain, but in the overall software testing methodology. We don't hear a whole lot about it. And as a result, I think there's a lot being assumed here about what constitutes ethical development, ethical testing, ethical application of artificial intelligence that 
perhaps could stand to be scrutinized more closely by ethicists and certainly should be taken into account in any complete and comprehensive look at the ethics of analytics and AI. That's it for this video. I'll be back with another one on the, uh, the deployment of AI, uh, the evaluation of it, and the use of these applications out there in the real world. For now, I'm Stephen Downs. Talk to you next time.